Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. This is going to be the beginning of a series. I don't know if I'll do three videos in a row, but in the course of the next whatever many videos, I'm going to do a few of these. And they are going to be campaign starters. That is to say, ways to start your campaign. It's the beginning of the year. Let's start a campaign. First, we're going to start with what I'll call the sandbox. And the sandbox, for people who don't know, is basically the kind of campaign where we're going to have lots of adventure hooks and the players themselves are going to draw kind of the story out of it. So they're going to decide what they do. And from each, you know, adventure, they will keep going and eventually a narrative will form. That is to say, you're not creating a big bad. You're not creating a, an end of the world situation. You're creating kind of a small, to start with, world that the players are going to get to explore as they go. And the campaign is going to build and change and shift. This is my preferable type of campaign. So we'll start here because it's the one I like the best. What I would say is number one, straight up, if you're starting a sandbox campaign or really any campaign, you should read the post from 2017 from Chicago Wiz. I will put a link called Just Three Hexes. And in this post, Chicago Wiz walks through how they start a campaign and they basically start it with three hexes, technically four, because they start with the settlement. And I'm going to use this as my baseline. Now, they have a beautiful concept and they say, this is how I did it. And they walk you through it. So definitely read that. I'm not going to rehash that too much. But I'm going to talk about how I'll use that as my basic system. And then we're going to add the rest of the stuff that I think that you'd want to have to start the campaign. So just quickly, the three hexes are essentially adventures. The fourth hex or the hex zero is your starting village. You're going to create a starting position for the characters. You're going to create three places of interest that they might want to explore. And then you're going to seed them with rumors about those. And again, at that point, they make a decision of where they want to go and you're off and running. But there's more to it than that and we'll get to it. One thing is this. If you are creating a hex map, in the case which we're going to do here, you don't need to create all the details everywhere. But I would create a decent amount of space to start with. Because if you think about it, if you're standing... I mean, I live in New York, so if I'm standing somewhere and I look out at the skyline, I can see in the distance mountains. You don't want to be creating your hex map one hex at a time and the character's exploring through this desert, then all of a sudden you roll a mountain, right? So some of those things we want to have in place. That's also going to help you with your water sources like rivers and stuff where they generally come from mountains. And there's lots of tools we can use to make those maps. A couple things we want to talk about in the settlement, though. So let's just start there. Number one, what you want to do is figure out where it is. And in my opinion, your best bet is to put it somewhere on what is often referred to as the borderlands. That is at the edge of adventure where there's lots of unknown space around. Obviously, there's going to have to be some way for the PCs to get there. I would not have them start there. The reason for that is because you want things to be mysterious. You want them to figure things out. You don't want the player to say to you, well, I've lived in this town my whole life. I don't know anything about that. So, you know, make it someplace where they've moved to. The way that I will generally do this is I will either start with some kind of narrative. And of course, you want to give the players an idea. This is what's going to happen before they make their characters. Some kind of narrative that gets them to the beginning and then drop them in the hex with the village. So, for instance, a very classic module B2, keep on the borderlands, starts with the players approaching this keep on the borderlands. That's all the information they really have. There was a road where they, they traveled for many days to get to the keep. There's a safe spot here, the keep itself. Once you're in there, there's rumors. And of course, very famously, there is a dungeon, the Caves of Chaos, that you can explore. So on that note, we want to make sure that when we make our village, it's not just in the middle of nowhere with no way that anybody would get in and out, right? The PCs had to have gotten there somehow. You can do it any way you want. You could do, for instance, keep on the borderlands. They traveled down this trade route, and this is basically the end point, right? They're trying to establish new areas, and this is the end of it. They, they're, they're at the end of the line, if you will. You could put it on a river which is what I'm probably going to do in my example that we're going to do as we go. You could put it on a regular trade route, like a caravan route. I've done that. When I did my Hyperborea campaign, I had the player characters start as caravan guards, and that's how they knew each other. And then when the caravan reached its destination, they started the adventure in this new city that nobody had been to. So I will definitely have a whole list in the description of different things, but there's a handful of tools I use a lot. One, I've talked about a bunch 
It's called the OD&D Referee Tools. That can roll up a lot of things for original Dungeons & Dragons, which is what I'm mostly using these days. So it rolls up encounters. It rolls up castles. It can roll up NPCs. That's super useful. If you want to roll up player characters or a little bit more detailed NPCs, there's the Total Party Kill Character Generator that I use a lot. And of course, something I've used for years and is an amazing resource is Donjon. So we'll definitely dip into those and I'll talk about a few other things as we go. Okay, so let's start with the starting hex. Again, you're going to want to create a town and there's loads of people that talk about starting towns and whatnot, but I'm going to kind of walk you through this a little bit. Donjon has a really nice little starting village creator if you want. It can create not just the map of it, but also the like the leader of it, the government. So you can use that if you want. That's a good way to go. Or just you can just make something up if you have an idea. Uh, you, these things, obviously, there's two ways to do this. And it wouldn't be much of a video if I just said, hey, if you have a couple of good ideas, just put them on the map. So we're going to walk into this as if we know we want to run a, a campaign, but we're, you know, we don't really have an idea of what we want to do. We have a lot of maybe little ideas. We don't have a fully formed idea. So let's assume that we're going to use a village that is created or town or city or whatever that's created using Donjon. The other way you could do it is you could find a small adventure that details a town, village, or city. There's lots of those out there. Again, going back to classic adventures, the village of Hamlet. Here you go. You have a village. You got a little dungeon. You're good to go. That's a place where you can start. But in your village, you want to establish, let's say you're going to make it from scratch, a few things. One is you want to establish how things get in and out of the village. That is, again, how do the player characters get there, but also how, do, how often and who comes in and out of the village. Also, you want to establish how rare or abundant certain things are. So if you are truly in the small you know, village of 50 people in the borderlands, you might not have, well, you might have a blacksmith or somebody who blacksmithed in the city that has moved there and they could fix some minor things, but they're not going to be able to make you a suit of plate mail armor. There's just not the resources. You also have to consider what's going to happen with all this treasure the player characters are going to have. How is that going to come in and out of this town? How is How does that connect? And in some ways, this is really nice because if you create a small village that can't really handle all the wealth, the player characters will eventually need to leave. And again, that's part of the sandbox, them moving on. Let's talk about the map for a second. We're going to place our starting village in the center of the map, right? That's going to be the center of the character's world to start off with. As far as the size of the map, I like to make my map where it will take no more than one week to reach any point on foot. So if you're doing, let's say, five mile hexes, like I generally do because I'm using the outdoor survival map a lot, and you can move three hexes a day, well, in a week, because you can travel six days, you can mostly go 18 hexes. That's as far as you'd be able to go on foot. So I wouldn't make it any more than, you know, 18 in any direction. If you make it bigger than that, it's, you know, you're not going to be able to explore it right away. This is where we can keep adding things later. So you do want to put some kind of mountains or something where the water's coming from. If you're going to put them, you know, put them with the 18 miles. I feel like if you're within 18 miles, I know that because of the curvature of the earth, we can only see so far or whatever, but. So for me, that would be a good size. 18 hexes out would be the biggest I would make it. Now, if the characters are going to have ready access to horses, you might want to make it bigger or maybe just make the hexes larger. That's probably what I would do and use if you're using horses, which move, let's say, twice as fast as a person or three times, I think three times as fast. I'd make the hexes instead of five miles. I would make them 15. Why? Well, because you're going to be able to explore each hex faster. So it kind of ra ratios out to be the same, right? Make the hexes larger, reduce the speed of the movement so you don't have to make such a huge map. You can always zoom in. So years ago, I backed a product called Hex Kit on Kickstarter. It's still available. It's a great little software that you download. You can make all kinds of maps with it. I love it. But it is a paid software. So I looked around to see what was available to whip up a hex, and I found something called Hex Friend. I used it a couple times just to see how stable it was. It seemed to work pretty well. So I'm going to put a link to that. If you want to make a quick map, I think it's a good spot to start. Now let's talk about three hexes. So in Chicago Wiz's example, the first hex that they set up is actually an adventure that they read about in a zine, and that's exactly what I would do. Take at least one of your hexes from some adventure that you found somewhere. I'm a follower of Tim Schwartz over at Gothridge Manor uh, on their Patreon, and you can actually go to their Patreon page and 
all the PDFs of, or I don't know if all of them, but the vast majority of the adventures that they create are there for free. You can also support at different levels. I support on the print level, so I get them uh, in the mail. But Tim makes great single location short adventures. So I think taking something like that or taking something from an, an issue of you know Carcass Crawler Magazine or Knock is a great way to start. Just take an adventure you like and boom, that's a location. Think about what the adventure is. Write up a couple of rumors. This is what the party's going to have. They're going to know something, something's over here, right? For your second location, or at least in this example, because again, you could just get creative, right? But again, we're going to create it from scratch. Maybe use something that's a generator. So for me, I'm going to use Perilous Wilds. This is for Dungeon World, and there's lots of stuff in here for Dungeon World. You can also get a version of this that is just the, the tables, which is probably all you need, but I already had this, so I didn't buy the tables separately. So I'll use the actual book, but if you just want the tables and you don't care about Dungeon World, then I think it might be a couple bucks cheaper to do it that way. For my third location, I'm going to use something I found online. I found a website, gnomestew.com. They had a, effectively a blog post about kind of creating this, creating hexes and hex crawls. But at the end of it, they have like a little lo location generator where you can roll, I believe it's 2d12 or something, but basically you roll on it to see the features in the hex. So I'm going to use that to create my third location. Then what we're going to do is we're going to place them on the map. Now, here's the thing. For me, I would place the adventures not equidistant from each other and ideally through different types of terrain. Again, this creates something where the player characters need to make a choice. Oh, just beyond this ridge, the, uh, the barren plains start. A two days journey out there, there is a tomb that, you know, people have gone to investigate, but nobody's ever returned, right? In the darkened forest where the kobolds dwell, there's a said to be a well in the ground that uh, if you crawl into it, there's vast treasures in a, in a mine, okay? Oh, there's in the mountains, there's a, uh, a temple that's been deserted long ago from an ancient cult. I heard that they used various uh, precious metals in all of their holy instruments, right? Now you've got three locations that are in different terrains, different styles, different places they can explore. Let them let some take more days than others. Maybe make one that's only a day or so away. Make one that's maybe a two or three day journey and make one that's at the maximum, you know, at like five day journey so that you're really, the characters can decide what they want to do. They might go to the closest one first, but they might not. Maybe the one far away is more appealing and they'll make that decision. And speaking of distance, <laughs> one thing we want to consider is our wandering monsters as we're traveling through the wilderness. We're going to want to make custom lists of wandering monsters. And what I like to do is do bands of difficulty. That is to say, the further you get from the village, the more difficult, the higher challenge, if you will, the monsters will be. So close to the village, you're going to run into more docile animals and maybe the occasional predator out there. As you get further out, you're going to find more and more predators. And further out from that, you might even find... Uh, you know, intelligent species that are that might raid, like orcs and gnolls and things like that, living further out, or maybe lycanthropes, uh, you know, clustered together. That's what you're going to find as you travel further and further out. This sets almost like the way the dungeons work, right? The player characters can decide their distance. So again, that five-day journey might seem like the best option for them because maybe they're like, oh, that's where the most treasure is. But not only is it multiple days in the wilderness, which means multiple chances of encounters, the encounters are going to get tougher because it's further away. And they have to also return, right? So if they get injured, they've got to go through all that to get back. So they need to really think about it before they hit these different spots. The thing is, don't make one right next to the village and then the other two super dangerously far away either. Because again, you want all the choices to seem interesting. So for me, I would put the one that seems the most dangerous, make that one maybe with the most details or at least the most... Uh, the most <laughs> alluring treasures, right? That said to have a golden crown worth 10,000 gold pieces where the other one is, you know, buried with some silver. You know, that way <laughs> the players can decide, are we going to be greedy? And that's what you want to do. You want to tempt them. So another thing we want to consider with our wandering monsters is we want to think about how they can lead to future adventure. That is to say, when you are encountering, I don't know, like a deer or a wild boar, that might not lead to anything. But when you encounter, let's say, a some kobolds and you roll that it's their lair, that could be another location. Or you roll some orcs and on their bodies, they might find a treasure map or they might 
trace back where the orcs came from to figure out where, where they were. You, or you might see tracks of a giant or a dragon flying overhead. All these encounters that you, you know, may or may not interact with the player characters can potentially lead to more quests. Not everyone, but a lot of them should have at least that potential. And of course, all of the quests that they go on could potentially lead to things. Remember, you're going to start at first level. So when they go out to that, you know, barrow and dig up the the treasure there, maybe there's rumor that there was a magic sword, but the the the, the sarcophagus has been cracked open and you see clearly their hands were like this, but there's no sword, but there's some gems and stuff. So they got some treasure. So where is that sword? Now they can try to figure out where it is, right? Maybe there's they can find another rumor. Maybe they can find clues there. There's all kinds of ways that you can figure out way more, you know, adventures from that original one. So everywhere they go, what you ultimately want to do, in my opinion, although some people, sometimes it bothers my players, I think, it bothers in a good way, is you never want to stop dropping stuff. There should be so many things going on that that get the players excited that they can't do all of them. That's the sandbox in my mind. There should just be, everything should be connected. You find stuff, you, what is this? Oh, we found this tomb. Oh, but here's a, a diary in here that somebody left talking about burying treasure somewhere else. Or they find the knight there and there is some gold and stuff and the sword's not magical. And then you find the diary saying, uh, my beloved, I know you want to be buried with your sword, but I thought tomb robbers would steal it. So instead I took it to the highest peak of the mountain, you know, again, and you can, <laughs> you can do that, right? So you can keep having these. I mean, don't do it to trick your players. Like like if the sword was supposed to be there, make sure that it's there. But my point is you can have breadcrumbs leading to other things. Let's take a second to talk about NPCs because this is going to be important. And I kind of put it at the end here because they're going to be NPCs everywhere. So number one, you're going to have NPCs in the village. These can be mundane people. They could be adventurers passing through. They could be merchants that come and go. They could be the way the player characters got there. Maybe, you know, if they came on a caravan, then the caravan will probably come back and forth. In the wilderness, you can also have NPCs. They can be groups of adventurers that the parties come across. They could be, you know, intelligent type races that the characters can interact with, maybe gnomes or kobolds or orcs. And finally, there can be NPCs in your adventure sites. I named a few closed off tombs. But what if you travel across the desert to this place that was a burial mound and you find now there's a monastery there that nobody knew about because nobody goes out there, right? Maybe everybody who went joined the monastery. Maybe those monks are actually magicians who are casting charm person spells and keeping people there, right? This can be a, an adventure. And this is the fun of it. We want to add NPCs as we go. And again, the player characters leave town for a week. They come back. Maybe somebody new has come to town. This is how we can seed them with more rumors. Because rumors are the lifeblood of the sandbox. Rumors, and to a lesser extent, in my opinion, quest givers, that is people asking the PCs to do things, basically, they're going to be in a place and they want to adventure. So give them ideas of where they can adventure. Oh, you know, we, we raided those uh, barrows and we saw that everybody was using these certain, or maybe they don't. Okay, player characters go out and they raid the barrows, they come back with these with all this treasure. And then some elder in the town is like, oh, those are the symbols of such and such, uh, you know, a cult of this, you know, deity or whatever. That's right. My great, great grandfather told me that four miles out this way, they used to have a conclave. Oh, really? <laughs> right. And this is how we continue to build our rumors. Rumors are what we want to keep this thing going. So now with all that in mind, I'm going to stop here as far as talking about it. I'm going to make it a, a small sandbox. I'll come back and give you an overview of what I created. Okay, I took some time to whip up effectively a sandbox based on what I was talking about, and I'm going to jump it back on my iPad and we're going to run through it quickly. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but you'll get the idea. Again, I created this using the, the hex. I'll put all links to all this stuff in the description. I didn't use what I normally use. I used the, the hex friend online so you guys could jump in and do the same software I did. Basically, I've got three locations here. This one in the, we got the the little house in the middle there is the starting hex with the river running through it. Then I've got a shrine off to the left of that. And to the right and up, I have a tower, which is a deserted wizard's tower. And then I have an, a forest full of uh, barrows, effectively. So that's kind of fun. Then I, ha I went to Don John and I made a starting village, Pruthi. And it's got a population of 41. 
the uh, it's governed by a reeve, and we have a few little locations there as well as some NPCs that have little bits of backstory and little fun things. You know, you've got Eomac, human Matt paladin, good, thin blonde hair and dark amber eyes. He wears banded mail and wields a short sword and shield. He seeks the meaning of a strange prophecy. And of course, Donjon has prophecies. So if you want to use this character, make a prophecy, add it to it. That's somebody the party can interact with. They could hire them as a henchman. They could just be somebody that they interact with in town. Then I created three adventuring spots, just like Chicago West recommends, right? We've got 1010 is the adventure location. Like I said, this is that forest littered with barrows. So here I took five adventures from Tim Shorts, small adventures that are like one session adventures. And I made a little mechanic where you, when you're searching the woods, you have a chance of finding one every day. Obviously you can clear it. You run that adventure when you do. You could create more barrows. You could look for other adventures. You could put a larger dungeon there that they might stumble upon, but this is what they know is there, if you will. No, based on rumors. Then I've got this ruin. I used Perilous Wilds for this to create it. I don't have a map for it, but the theme is basically a wizard who a plague to wipe them out and unsettled dead, or it's unquiet dead is what it is. And we've got several cool things here. We've got a dead creature. We have junk, an elemental trap, a puzzle, another dead creature, a magic pool, which is always fun. Coins, so you get some treasure there. You've got a couple of creatures fighting each other, an altar. It says creature returning, so I thought maybe the wizard. But then we also rolled a high priest. So I kind of imagine, and again, you could run this depending on your campaign how you want. I kind of imagine this high priest maybe trying to bring back the wizard spirit, maybe using speak with dead or something to get some information, right? So they might be a good high priest or an evil one. It depends on what you want to play, right? Then we have uh, creatures waiting in ambush. That could be the high priest's minions, maybe, right? And a locked door or gate, which I was thinking to myself, that could either be the entrance or better, an entrance to another level, maybe below, and you could create another dungeon down there. Finally, I created another kind of spot here. This one's got a nice, simple quest to it. It's a shrine that's been overrun. I'm using a map from Dyson Logos, and you can use some of the information from that. I just put a link here to where the, the, the blog post is which is nice because I can look and see what Dyson wrote. Maybe I want to use some of that. But for me, I've decided that the grotto under the shrine is being occupied by an ogre and some wolves. And if the, it can be cleared out, then perhaps a good cleric can kind of make the shrine uh, holy again, and that could be advantageous to the area. I then went in and created a list of wandering monsters, and this is kind of how I did it. Just to, I've talked about this before, I think, but I'm just going to kind of walk through this for a second. So in the hills... What I did was I just went on my wandering monster list and I just rolled, I think, eight uh, wandering monsters. And then I made this list nice. I sorted them by how tough they were. And depending on how far away you are, you roll either a D6, a D6 plus two, or a D8 plus two. And then you look at the chart. So you're rolling a D6, you can get anything from roll again with potential for, a, a, you know, roll again plus two with plus two, which could be potential for a tougher monster, to just some spore. You might get an orc or a brigand. If you roll all the ways at the very top of it, you're running into a white dragon or at least seeing one. Forest, again, has their own. Grasslands has their own, and so does Swamp. Finally, I went in here and I went on Donjon and just basically copy and pasted a whole bunch of rumors that we can use to shape based on our land. So a ruined fort in the swamp to the south contains a secret cache of magical weapons. That originally said that it was uh, something else, and I changed it to a ruined fort because I didn't feel like, oh, it said something about a city vault or something. So I just shifted it to work. But a pack of flesh-eating uh, ghouls uh, prowls through the dead fen marsh. <laughs> That'll work anywhere. Finally, I went in and just copy and pasted again a bunch of NPCs that we can play with. Some of these have interesting backgrounds. Uh, Cyrilly, Cyrilly, female elf, tall and willowy, long blonde hair, blue eyes. Wears fine jewelry. Uh, she is wrongly sought by the paladins uh, of the Abbey of Emperor Sky for theft. So here we go. Here's somebody who might want the party to help them prove that they're innocent, or they might just join the party, maybe trying to get away from you know the law as it would be. <laughs> and finally, I just put some links at the bottom of my document to tools I was using so that I would have them available. When you're making a campaign, you don't have to give that much. This might seem like a lot, but I think it took me maybe an hour or so, and I was recording a video while I was doing it. 
use some of the generators, create some basic quest hooks. The real gaming happens at the table, especially in the sandbox. So really what you want to do is create some adventure hooks and some interesting people, see how the players interact with it, and then add as you go. That's really going to be the, a running theme on this series. I'll tell you that right now. Even in a more linear type campaign, you're still not going to want to create the entire thing at the beginning. You need to add and shift and create as you go to make it work for your players, right? If you create something whole cloth, you'll almost certainly have to change it when the players interact. So why not evolve it with them? That's what I like to do anyways. Let me know what you think about this. Have you built sandboxes before? Have you used this Chicago Wiz technique? Definitely check out their blog, read about it. They have a few zines too. I think you can purchase them maybe on drive through You'll see all that stuff on the blog and that's well worth it. Really good content there. If you haven't already, please do like the video, ring the bell, subscribe to the channel, do the hokey pokey, you know, do all that stuff you got to do. Check the, the description below. I will put links to all these tools that I use to make this sandbox starter. I'll also put a link to my Discord server if you want to jump over there and talk about it, and a link to my Patreon if you want to support the channel. I'll talk to you soon.